Good afternoon to you. I'm Danilo Evangelista and welcome to our tropical weather video for today, Saturday, June 8th, 2024. Let's get started, shall we, with the National Hurricane Center homepage as we do every single video, taking a look at what's happening over the next seven days. The Atlantic continues to remain quiet, um, nothing consistent yet, no areas of development yet with um, development in the Atlantic, although I'm pretty sure over the next several days we'll probably get something at least mentioned by the National Hurricane Center in the Caribbean Gulf and Gulf, the way it's going. Um, in the Eastern Pacific, though, it also remains quiet there, and I've not even seen any sort of major signals yet um, for development in the Eastern Pacific. So until that happens, the Eastern Pacific as well remains on the quiet side. Um, taking a satellite shot of the Atlantic with the um, I IR simulated satellite, not simulated, just IR satellite, you could see how it looks like in the Atlantic. Not much going on, nothing yet organized in terms of convective activity. There's still lots of strong wind shear across the Atlantic. We still have a strong subtropical jet, um, which is cutting strong upper level wind shear, uh, strong upper level winds across the Atlantic. And until that lifts northward and until we get wind shear to start relaxing on a larger scale, especially in the Western Atlantic, we're not really going to get any sort of major development, although that is a fact, although that is something that is probably well known among everybody. And in terms of tropical waves, um, not much going on with that either, although I guess there is talk about potentially some of these waves, um, even though they might not be amplified now, maybe um, they could amplify a little bit further, especially as they head further west. And maybe some of these waves that we have out here in the MDR right now might help fuel whatever development occurs um, in the Central and Western Caribbean with this whole big messy setup that we're going to have, it seems like, next week. Um, really quickly, though, I want to talk about sea surface temperature anomalies because they're once again still a huge topic, especially when it comes to hurricane season. We still have, um, and I'll show you in a minute with the tweet, record warm sea surface temperature anomalies across the MDR still widespread, not just in the MDR, but even through portions of the Canary Current too. Um, Caribbean, Gulf of Mexico, look at that areas, many areas very consistently either between one or even two um, degrees Celsius above normal, above the long-term average. And this is really just an alarming sign to just to just continue to allude to the fact that there's a lot of heat in the atmosphere this year, um, and especially it re reflected in the oceans as well. And when conditions do become favorable, best believe the Atlantic will definitely um, be favorable um, for development um, this year. And then, of course, on top of the fact that we have a developing La Nina, combine those two together and you definitely have an active hurricane season in the cards. And it's astonishing as well um, that these sea surface temperature anomalies are not only warm, but they're record warm. Um, this is a tweet by Michael Lowry to kind of put it into perspective. Eight weeks of persistent record warm sea surface temperature anomalies, he mentions, stretching from the Caribbean, the Canary Islands, all the way to the Gulf of Mexico. So basically the entire um, Atlantic Basin with the near record warm sea surface temperature anomalies, as he mentions, for basically the last eight weeks. So that's been um, since, I think, March, I think he mentions, or early April, we've had extremely warm sea surface temperature anomalies across the Caribbean and Gulf. The biggest important thing that this has been a long standing sort of situation that we've had, and it actually stretches back even further than eight weeks, all the way since the beginning of the year, we've beginning of the year, we've had an extremely warm Atlantic. Um, and he mentions, no matter how you slice it, it does not look great. And I can definitely agree with that. And if we even take a look at that, in terms of actual sea surface temperatures, this is the Gulf of Mexico. And this just puts into perspective how warm it actually is, not just in terms of the anomalies like this map is. This is anomalies, or as we like to call it, the departure from normal. Um, but when we actually take a look at this map, this is the actual sea surface temperatures. And what is the reflection of near record warm, at least in the Gulf? Well, that is basically in June, early June, almost the entire Gulf at least submerged in this 29 degrees Celsius isotherm, basically meaning almost the entire Gulf already is very warm in the mid to upper 80s. And keep in mind, the Gulf, even, even in a regular year where the Gulf is regularly right at where right at where it should be, 
almost always by the time it gets to August and September, it'll be more than warm enough for development in the in in the Gulf of Mexico, no matter what. But the fact that we're already in only June and we see anomaly we see sea surface temperatures twenty eight to twenty nine in some places this is already even warmer than than we would even see in the Gulf in September in the peak of the season, especially in the portions of the southern Gulf, but increasingly probably spreading throughout the entire open Gulf as well, um, off the southwest coast of Florida, even through the Canary Current here, that's what this is, the Gulf Stream kind of, not the Canary Current, the Gulf Stream, um, you get what I mean, um, kind of poking up northward, bringing in very warm, even warmer sea surface temperatures from the Caribbean, and then we also have the Bay of Campeche as well. And I'd imagine that these areas will probably spread um, and become more connected in terms of overall how much of the Gulf is submerged, even in these 30s, we'll probably see that um, in the next several weeks. And we even see some patches, especially very small for now, but they're still there. Portions even as much as 31 off the southwest coast of Cuba, and I'm pretty sure over the next several weeks, that'll also spread out too. But it's not just the Gulf, honestly, it's the entire Atlantic. Um, and the general bottom line that you would kind of take away from this is areas because this is this map we kind of look at 20 we have all the small little isotherms here so 28 29 30 this map kind of puts into perspective how the atlantic is at least the western atlantic is um as a whole warm and this entire line here all of this that you see shaded in is either 28 degrees celsius or higher basically throughout the entire Caribbean and Gulf, we're in at least sea surface temperatures that are 28 Celsius um, or higher. And once again, that translates to um, mid, even sometimes upper 80s, although this is, that's more or less around the mid 80s category. Um, but still, the entire Atlantic, we're in mid 80s, 28 Celsius across the entire Western Atlantic, and especially um, now, where we're looking at development potentially in this area, it certainly increases the chances and certainly makes us wonder um, exactly what what kind of development or maybe a development that does occur might have an easier time just because of how warm um, the Atlantic is, especially in the Western um, Caribbean and the Gulf of Mexico, which is where um, we're really looking at, especially this time of year. Um, for development to occur. And obviously, development to occur um, probably very soon as well, or at least not entirely sure yet, but there's that potential. I actually want to start with the GFS first, not the European. Um, but yeah, so we're talking about development. We've been talking about it for the last several weeks that once we would get to around this time period, as we're getting um, further into June, that we would start looking at development. And let's just really quickly run through the GFS. You can kind of see that something does start getting start does start to get going around hour 120. You could kind of see very disorganized, but I guess you could say maybe a slight improvement um, from yesterday where if you, I think it was yesterday where the GFS had this huge, um, very much gyre-like situation centered over the Gulf of Mexico, and it just looked like a broad disorganized mess. I guess if we take a look at the 12Z GFS today, actually, never mind. it's kind of the same, honestly hour 150 you could see um lots of vorticity but the thing is it is very spread out and not um organized over one central area when we look at tropical development tropical cyclone development i should point out we tend to look at it over one centralized area of vorticity and low level turning this is a very very broad area of where there's just a whole bunch of vorticity and mess and probably the biggest concern we would look at this um, besides tropical development is definitely widespread heavy rain and gusty winds over over portions of probably the southeast in Florida. And honestly, um, whether or not this will develop into a tropical system, those will probably be the impacts either way. Um, I did mention this, I think, yesterday, but not always do we need a name to categorize these systems because either way, any sort of impacts, even tropical storm-like impacts could occur without a tropical system actually being named. And that is something very important to note. 
um, and to keep in mind. So even if this doesn't become a name, there still will be gusty winds and probably very heavy flood, very heavy rains and probably flooding rain too across portions of Florida. And I could also imagine the Caribbean as well. And then, and then as we get towards hour 168, maybe, just maybe, and I've seen some other models do this, maybe um, once this area kind of moves to the Northeast and if it does indeed end up in the, uh, over the Southeast, maybe there's something that kind of tries to organize a little bit more with this low pressure, or at least that's what it seems like once we get to hour 168 on the GFS. But I'm going to show you, man, the GFS just gets weird after that. I mean, <laughs> this is why sometimes where we don't always trust the GFS, and this is why the models sometimes get really confusing, because from that one area that the GFS has, it ends up splitting into these two low level pressure sort of vorticities i guess you could call it on the gfs and then after that it just kind of gets all weird and strange um but i guess I, besides that the main area of concern would probably be on um, whatever's still in the gulf of mexico that's what seems like to be of more concern and especially you would notice that all of this stuff that happens off the southeast coast maybe is not that you know credible is if we just take a look at the european not the 12z not the 60. I actually want to bring up the 12Z and see what they show. Not the AIFS. Here we go. The 12Z of the European. Um, let me bring the vorticity. Sorry. Um, you know, sometimes could be a little bit better in terms of my organization, but you generally get what I mean. But here we are, hour 192, hour 168. The GFS had this area of vorticity off the southeast coast. And what does the European have? nothing absolutely everything is sort of concentrated in the gulf if there is anything to really be concentrated about concentrated with in terms of vorticity um the european honestly doesn't really even do that much with this system um kind of just has it as some sort of area of broad um you notice there's some vorticity in the gulf but it's really not concentrated and it's sort of broad and disorganized and then out, right right out to hour 240 um, nothing of note develops in the Gulf, whereas opposed to the GFS, they have all these sort of um, low pressures kind of running around and breaking off from each other and becoming other pieces of vorticity. So the bottom line you could take from that is conditions may be favorable. Maybe we might see at least sea surface temperatures. We might see things definitely um, in the green light. Um, for development, but I think the models right now have a huge, um, tough, you know, time um, trying to comprehend the sort of organization of the system, especially because of how broad and disorganized it may be. You could you could already see we still have major differences on what the GFS and the European show, and those are two main models really when it comes to looking at development in the Atlantic and tropical cyclone and tropical cyclone tracking in general, it tends to be the European and GFS that we look at the most. And when we have major disagreement between those two models, it definitely sets us in a sort of headache as to what to expect. So at least with that, assuming right now that this sort of inconsistency continues, we may maybe may not have development over the next week or so. Um, it really it all depends, but whether we have development or not, always advise you to watch the tropics um, and see what happens because especially with the Gulf as warm as it is right now, I can assure you something that whenever it does actually get into favorable conditions, something that will actually try to develop, I'm pretty sure probably and most definitely will. Um, with that being said though, I'm gonna end it off here. Um, hope, hope you enjoyed what you saw today. If you did, always encourage you to like, comment, subscribe, share with family and friends. Share your comments and the thoughts as well. Share your thoughts in the comments as well. Um, <laughs> sometimes, you know, get ahead of my words and end up mixing them up, but I'm pretty sure you, you understand what I meant. If you have any questions, shoot them in the comments. I'll try to respond. Um, though with that being said, stay safe. Have a blessed day. Have a safe one as well. Um, peace, love, and kindness to all of you. And we will talk again very soon.